this track. My name is Emmeline Wong. Dajahao. I speak a little bit of Mandarin, but uh, was born in the U.S., so appreciate any opportunity to practice my business Mandarin. Um, today, I'm going to talk about what innovative businesses do differently. So, unlike my colleagues who were able to talk about fintech, mine is going to cover the broad range of various industries. And I'll put up a slide later that kind of shows you what you can talk to me about. Most of my travel is related to microservices and APIs, and I'm very grateful for that. Before this, I spent 15 years in R&D on API teams, designing and building APIs. And the best part is now I get to get feedback about what it's like to be, as my colleague Uli would say, outside of the firewall. It's really important to get that experience to understand how to bring that back into product and engineering organizations. I'm on a team at Axway called The Catalysts. So most of you might know this as a center of excellence or a hub of innovation that looks across the company. It's trifold. We look at our API story. How are we drinking the champagne and building APIs internally to follow exactly what we tell our customers? There's also the evangelism arm. And then there's the arm where we work closely with our customers and partners like you to make sure that you're successful for the long haul. So it felt a little bit strange to kind of quote myself, but I was trying to find the words to describe the experiences that I had. And so the rest of the presentation is going to borrow language that I found from Forrester, Gartner, our friends at Pivotal, and Harvard Business Review, because they were able to, and I should use the terms that they have that describe the experiences I had working in API. I thought about this conference and how we're talking about APIs. How do you connect that to the different stories? You could have an entire conference just about economy. You could have an entire conference just about platforms. What makes your API different to where you're able to deliver a platform that then turns into an economy and the money and the resources that flow from that platform then allow you to enter new markets? So when I was working at Berkshire Hathaway, we did this. We were able to save money in North America based on our API strategy to then be able to open markets in uh, Tokyo and um, in, Sing in South Korea. So I thought about the fact that biologically, API ecosystems are very much like business ecosystems. They're very delicate. So I worked for a company, Platform as a Service, in Austin, Texas where we ran a marketplace. And so just like the platforms that you see with Airbnb and Lyft, we needed to have the right players in this very fragile ecosystem. And we had to constantly balance users and service providers and how we captured that value. And so this is where I came up with the terminology that because the API is a contract, it needs to be consistent. So later I'll be delivering a technical workshop with Uli and what I discovered in enterprises is without this consistency and without API design, when massive enterprises just kind of throw the API over the wall, even though it's an internal API, what happens is the consuming parties have a very difficult time ramping up and learning the diverse APIs that the enterprise has to offer, even if it's within the company. So a lot of people say, I don't have time for API design. But do you have time, from a PR perspective, to fight these kind of stories? Uh, this is actually the data visualization from David McCandless. Um, his website, his information is beautiful. And he is able to create an interactive experience that shows 30,000 users and up data breaches that have happened over time. And you can filter based on what you see. So it's a matter of API design that helps prevent these kind of data breaches. If you design the security and the consistency within your API, it's easier to protect your businesses. And so I was talking to many of you out here since yesterday, uh, slightly apologizing because some of you are from these companies. And, and I remember one uh, conference attendee said, oh, good, that's not my division. 
right? However, how can you prevent divisions of your uh, business to not show up in the news? So I'm going to now refer to Harvard Business Review's language when it comes to network effects. So the way that you respond to network effects in your ecosystem, in your platform, and you have to constantly respond, it's cyclical, that's what determines if you're successful. So don't worry about this terminology. I'll try to describe it in a way that just talks about patterns. So I'm excited to hear um, the representative from Airbnb, her talk will be later. They're able to survive because they have a global network and it's very expensive to enter that network. Whereas if you've heard local wars even here um, with Uber because they have localized clusters. Now these patterns are very important because the business patterns then determine how you design your API. Now I'm going to switch over and talk about clustering um, in terms of the fitness industry. So I love to work out. So who here loves uh, yoga or cardio or lift, lifting weights? Awesome. So I love working out. But I have this issue where I have so many different devices and apps, I can't capture all of the data on a super app, like I, th I think it was the gentleman Kenan mentioned this morning. And why is that an issue? So there's a platform called ClassPass and Mind and Body. And they have, if you will, super apps to capture all of the um, global and local ways of doing network effects. So I'll explain. ClassPass is a way for you to go to almost any studio in the world. So you buy one membership and you're not tied to any studio and you can work out anywhere in the world. So the reason why they can survive is they're both global and local with their clustering. Same thing with MindBody developers. However, there's an interesting sort of situation. How do you lock that value in the platform so that you've got Mirror and you've got uh, Peloton? So Orange Theory Fitness does this. You can go to Orange Theory Fitness anywhere in the world. But they lock their data in their device, in their mobile apps, and in their local studios. And that's interesting because that's how they compete against something like ClassPass. So for example, they, they wouldn't offer their classes there. One of the reasons is brand dilution. So any time that you use a pattern that could be open for all, you have to figure out how to not give away that value. Let me talk about WeWork. So they have platform maturity in a way where because it's the most mature platform, so if you look at their apps for their entire ecosystem, from living to working to wellness, same thing. They keep their APIs internal. Part of it is they dominate the market. So anytime you have mature APIs, mature platform, that's how you have that higher market position. Same thing with experience. You have one card, one app, one way of booking conference rooms. So this is me visualizing their ecosystem. They're able to tie these things that don't seem to go together and bring a user value and keep bringing them back for more. And a little bit about maturity, because my colleague from IBM and my colleagues from Postman are going to cover a maturity later. But these are some statements for you to think about. Where are you? Where is your company? Is it an afterthought when you think about API design and strategy? Or is it more justified? You have to because your competitors are doing it. Or are you confident? Do you know that your API design is your core advantage? that you're thoughtfully thinking out uh, as a company like National Instruments that has a 100-year plan, and you're thinking outwards as to how you can design something so that it's less painful for developers and businesses to adopt. So I, answering a lot of the questions that were on the website for Ecosystem for API Days, and it asked about partnerships. Should you have an aggregated network? or should you just go one-to-one -one and be very strategic? I argue it's not transactional. It's very much relational. And even though I'm based in the US where things are more uh, tran uh, transactional, I've noticed that um, in the Middle East, and especially here in Asia, it really hinges on the relationship. So these are statements. I wanted to make sure I quoted my sources. 
that talk about disintermediation. So what happens is, say you match on your platform, but they can then work with each other outside of your platform. Now you've lost that. How do you regain that? Or say it's cheap to use all of the ride-hailing services, so both service providers and users you use multiple ones, right? So how do you combat those situations? Because it's cheap to adopt the platform. So what I offer you is that unique end-to-end -end experience. So you work and you think of it as the entire experience. And then you have to navigate what it is inside your company and outside your company tirelessly, tirelessly to deliver that experience. And that's what's going to keep people on your platform. Then network bridging. So now we're panning 50,000 feet out. This is another question that Mehdi and the founders put together in Asia. So I'm not an expert in business in Asia, but how do APIs help? That's one thing that I can, can answer. And what I did was I took the Alibaba economy uh, picture and layer, and I really thought about my experiences, and I put them together. So 7-Eleven is, of course, a Japanese company. But did you know that in Dallas, Texas, where I live, that's actually where the headquarters are? And so how do you have two different cultures where it's very different? And I'll explain. So you've got Amazon and Alibaba that have a lot of similarities. That's why I didn't include the words again. But then you look at 7-Eleven and you compare the same economy. And what you see is there's the local aspect so 7-Eleven is far more exciting here. In fact, I wish I could box one up and take it home with me. The other thing that um, platforms and economies are now doing is if they're competing in retail or spaces that they're not usually in, then they won't use the cloud provider that's also competing with them in the same space. So 7-Eleven is Azure and GCP, and they have the uh, hybrid situation there. So some of the key takeaways, again, the unique incentive and that amazing experience. And then readiness. So the toughest, the question I've been answering the most is, everything we're talking about here is very ideal. How do I take this home and show my senior management? Or the opposite, I'm senior management, but how do I get my organization ready to deliver on innovation that's going to disrupt? So as many of you know, there are a lot of businesses that could survive 200 plus years like Dun & Bradstreet and have lucrative APIs, such as their big data API. But then there are others that didn't make it, right? So how do you co uh, combat that? And I, I argue that it's diverse and decentralized APIs. So, that, so I'm quoting Mehdi's uh, book, Continuous API Management, where he mentions that the larger your organization, the more you have to have these diverse policies in place, processes, where each team can autonomously innovate. And then finally, I mentioned hybrid earlier. Um, I participate in the Async API technical specification. And as many of you in the financial industry know, messaging-based APIs, where it's a non-HTTP protocol, and where it supports multiple event-driven uh, specifications or protocols, that's really important to bring into our platforms and our ecosystems. And so the charge that I lead with you is to come and uh, contribute your talent and your resources to this open source community. And this is my, my favorite part, is the fact that many of us are contributing. And so we need help with tooling and um, to, to communicate event-driven architecture um, across the different platforms that today are using mature open API specs. And so these are the things you can talk to me about. Um, patterns, community outreach. I've worked in both hardware and software, so IoT and how it connects with um, the space, API strategy. And then these particular scenarios. And I'm just looking forward to the conversations that we get to have together after this, that we can together make this community an amazing one, continue to keep it very welcoming. Um, thank you very much. Thanks, Emmeline. Uh, are there any questions for Emmeline? 
All right, actually, I have one for you. Um, so you talked about orange theory, you talked about uh, certainly class pass, you know, mind body and so forth. One of the things I thought was interesting is they do kind of lock you into their own worlds, right? And uh, if we're talking about ecosystems in this arena and, and kind of how ecosystems can span across um, certainly verticals, but companies and so forth, how do you see the two, um, I guess, diverse thought patterns of, you know, yes, I use APIs, but they're all internal, and I want to hold on to things and not expose them, but we're also trying to talk about leveraging an ecosystem which goes beyond your own company boundaries. How do the two really kind of coexist in that space? Sure, thank you so much for asking me that question. So I don't know if you saw that slide that had the many different layers and I talked about there how there's a whole landscape. Well, so the way that we have to show companies is to take your ecosystem and to be able to expose partner-based APIs so that you can create an economy. And it's tricky, right? Because if you're trying to lock that value in your platform, it's going to take some sales skills to show the value to the business of actually exposing those APIs. And to me, I think we can take lessons from the finance industry and fintech to then show other industries, to, because most people are very scared of exposing data, and they're not sure how to do it. So what happens is they're agile, and they just start building APIs, and they haven't thought about how they're going to have a bigger vision or plan of affecting, for example, you know, the fitness landscape. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.